Hi, my name is Nikolai Van Orris, and I'd like to tell you today about our studies on the FOXN1 transcription factor and how we have discovered compound heterozygous mutations in this transcription factor that lead to a selective thymic hyperplasia in patients. So the thymus is actually a very large organ at birth, and in this case, this is a thymus that was obtained from a child undergoing cardiothoracic surgery. You can see this weight is about 40 grams and it spanned about 7 centimeters. If one takes a slice through this tissue and examines it by H&E staining, one can see a very purple rich area which are the immature thymocytes that are developing in the cortex. And these are double negative and double positive thymocyte subsets. And those that are selected to mature on the basis of recognizing self-peptide, self-HLA molecules undergo a differentiation stage to the single positive lineage which migrate into the medullary region where there's a second round of selection events to ensure the elimination of potentially autoreactive cells as well as the induction of T regulatory cells to control autoreactivity in the periphery. Now the developmental process of these double negative, double positive, and signal, single positive cells relies on thymocyte interactions with a epithelial meshwork. And these are referred to as thymic epithelial cells. And shown in this structure, scanning EM, these are this interwoven meshwork of cells through which the developing thymocytes percolate engaging peptide HLA molecules that are expressed on the third surface of the epithelial cells. Now the functions of the thymus can actually be assessed by an assay called T-cell receptor excision circles. And this has become a standard screening process for all newborns born in the United States. And it is a test that looks at the presence of these T-cell receptor excision circles as a marker for T-cell output from the thymus. So if the levels are actually quite low or absent, this is suggestive of an immunodeficiency. And the lack or absence of T cells as a consequence will lead to an increased susceptibility of infants to different viral and bacterial infections. In fact, a complete absence of TREX can lead to an immunodeficiency syndrome. So if a patient initially comes in and is seen with low TREK numbers, one usually needs to do a repeat screening to confirm that these TREKs are low. And this is then followed up, of course, by an immunological assessment to determine what is the status of the immune system. And if there's a suggestion of an immunodeficiency, often genetic screening is then proposed in order to identify potentially causing mutations. So it's in this context that we present two infants who presented with low TREX defined as a T negative low phenotype with B cells and NK cells. What was unique about these two infants presented in this paper is that both had distinct compound heterozygous mutations in human FOXN1. Now FOXN1 is the master transcriptional regulator of thymic epithelial cells. And an absence or a mutation in FOXN1 can lead to the failure of epithelial cells to develop. This results in a failure of T cell development. One sees an absent to low TREK numbers, and this would certainly be indicative of a thymic hyperplasia or aplasia. But what was unusual about these two infants is they had normal hair extrusion and nail beds. And this is in contrast to the classic autosomal recessive mutations that have so far been described in human FOXN1. This leads to a classic phenotype referred to as the nude skid. The skid comes from the absence of the thymus, or a non-functional thymus, so there are no TREX, no T cells, as well as alopecia universalis and nail dystrophy. So if we had a situation of two children that had compound heterozygous mutations that had this atypical presentation. So the question we had was, are these mutations in FOXN1 causal to this thymic hyperplasia. So this is a cartoon diagram of the cDNA of FOXN1. There are eight coding exons, and there is a DNA binding domain in the middle of the gene, as well as a transactivation domain at the very distal end. And in red, I'm showing you the regions that are defined with autosomal recessive mutations that have been characterized 
for a vol small number of patients. These autosomal recessive mutations generally interrupt the expression of the protein, so we have no DNA binding domain that's produced, or a point mutation in the DNA binding domain. And this leads to a complete loss of FOXN1 functional activity. We, on the other hand, had one patient that presented with one allelic mutation at position 933, and a second allelic mutation on the other allele at position 1089. The first mutation led to a truncation of the protein again, frame shift, but the second mutation had only a 5-amino acid deletion followed by an in-frame protein that was produced. The second child was born with distinct compound het mutations, one position 1288 and the other position at 1465. And these lead to a point mutation, so that we change an amino acid immediately upstream of the transactivation domain, or again, a frame shift in this transactivation domain. So we focused our studies on patient one, and we generated mice to genocopy those FOXN1 mutations. So here's a normal wild-type mouse, and right beside it we have a mouse that has mutations on both alleles at position 933. And here you can see this sort of classic nude phenotype, no whiskers, very small nails, and this sort of hairless phenotype. In contrast, when we generated the compound heterozygous mutations that matched patient 1, we see a normal appearing mouse, same size, same growth. When we, however, looked at the thymic structure from this mouse, it was extremely hypoplastic compared to a normal wild-type thymus shown on the left. So these mice have a severe thymic hyplasia. And we can then look at these small tissues and compare them to the wild-type tissue. So on the panel on the left, what I'm showing you is the staining patterns of a normal thymus. So one starts with the double negative population in the lower left quadrant. These develop into the double positive cells in the upper right quadrant. These begin rearranging the T-cell receptor, and the specificity of the T-cell receptor for self-peptide self-HLA determines the subset of cells that develop into the CD4 or CD8 single positive lineages. Now in the FOXN1-933-1089 mice that phenocopy or genocopy the human patient, you can see there's absolutely no T-cell development. So these mice have no T-cells. And this is evidenced by looking at the lymph node populations in these mice. So again, in a wild-type setting, we have B cells characterized by a B220 marker and T cells characterized by the CD3 marker. In the mice that genocopy patient 1, we only see B cells as the lymphocyte population. There are no T cells. And we subsequently looked at the presence of NK cells, and this allowed us to determine that these mice phenocopied the patient with a T-negative B plus NK plus phenotype. So what are the clinical conditions that result in low TREX at birth? Well, one of the primary ones is actually premature birth, followed by stress. And in addition, babies that are born to mothers who had gestational diabetes can also present with low TREX at birth. Then we get into conditions which are congenital malformations, such as 22q11.2 deletion syndrome, and this can lead to low TREX due to a failure of the thymic stromal tissue to develop properly. And today, I mentioned a little bit about the autosomal recessive mutations that have been characterized in FOXN1, leading to a very rare nude skid phenotype. However, we now have a situation where we're re-identifying individuals with compound heterozygous mutations in FOXN1. Again, these are rare and can lead to a skid phenotype, but what's very important to understand is we need to know where these mutations are in FOXN1 and whether they impact the DNA binding and transactivation domains of this key transcription factor. And there are more reports emerging of individuals that have single allelic mutations in FOXN1 with some T cell losses. So understanding the biological role of FOXN1 requires one to identify the mutations and how they impact the function. So I'll stop there, and again, I'd like to thank a number of the clinicians who have been involved in this study, as well as members of my lab who are listed next. Thank you.